Okay, Mr. Thompson, you may proceed. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court, counsel. Um, I'm in an unusual situation. You spent 30 minutes talking about essentially the same issues, so I'm going to cut right to the chase. Um, <clears throat> Justice Apple, you asked a question and, and I think made reference to Mr. Gribble's view that Chapter 20, you know, is, stands on its own, and, and you raised the issue of whether it was comprehensive. Um, it is. It, it's clearly comprehensive. It's a statutory scheme that deals with many issues. It creates a duty to bargain. It imposes a process to follow if there are disagreements. This court has already determined that it delegates to PERB the oversight for bargain, <coughs> excuse me, bargaining. It sets up a process to adjudicate and conciliate disputes between public employers and unions representing public employees. So why doesn't it have the <laughs> requirement of ratification by the governing body? Uh, I think that, again, on the ratification question, what it does do is authorize PERB to promulgate rules to effectuate yeah, the but statute. If the sta yeah, sure, but the, but the rules have to be consistent with the statute. And, and I'm, I, I'm struggling with this because this is our first collective bargaining statute in 1974. There hadn't been anything before that. Um, and it's designed to be comprehensive. Um, the notion of, of ratification was on the mind of the legislature, obviously, because it requires union ratification. And yet it doesn't drop in that, you know, there's a mutual ratification requirement. That strikes me as at least a bit odd, and I want you to... Well, I, you know. I don't disagree, and I think the law is clear that a rule can't expand the statute, but the statutory scheme, Mr. Gribble, Gribble is referring to, to 2017 for a lot as if, if it just says offer and acceptance. Well, it doesn't. It's exhaustive. And, and it talks about impasse procedures. It talks about the board's obligation to facilitate facilitate negotiation and an ultimate agreement or forcing binding arbitration. So it really deals with bargaining and enforcement. At the end, and, and really part of why I want to talk about the fact that we've just had a 30-minute conversation about uh, authority, offer and acceptance, and, and really a formation argument. And this court has already recognized the difference between a formation argument and an argument about enforcement in the AFSCME case in 1992. And the argument you just heard underscores the fact that this dispute, which is essentially the same, the facts are basically the same, the outcomes were different, which actually argues in favor of putting this in front of PERB so we can get some consistencies here. But everything you just heard is a formation argument. And in Maquoketa Valley, uh, in other cases, this court has recognized that the bargaining of the contract, the formation concept, is governed by Chapter 20. There are mandatory procedures, there are PPCs that you can file, and that it's subject only to judicial review. That's but, uh, why we've made know, the, the problem is when I compare, I, I know very little, if anything, about public employee bargaining. I know a little bit about private. NLRB labor law. And if I compare, you know, my, my basis of comparison is I'm looking at the National Labor Relations Act. If I compare Mr. Thompson, Section 301 of the LMRA says suits for violations of contracts can be brought in district court. And here it's suits to enforce the terms of collective bargaining agreements can be brought in court. That's, it seems to me the, the NLRA language is clearer than what we have here, that, that, that this is not something that, in, in a private labor law context, this wouldn't be something that would, could be brought in court. And similarly, that, uh, if comparing it to the, N, to the uh, NLRA, the NLRA makes it an unfair labor practice specifically to fail to execute a written contract incorporating any agreement reached if requested by either party, but the, our, our public um, bargaining law doesn't have that. So, you know, given, given those, you know, kind of contrasts, uh, wh what am I supposed to do? It, it seems to me it's not as, it's not 
clearly delegated to the agency the way it is under federal labor, labor well, law? Well, I think it's delegated in a different way. I think it's not as clear perhaps in that particular statute you point to, but, but we've got an exhaustive statute. If you look at the definition of prohibited uh, practices in the code. In fact, if you look at the, the prohibitive practice complaint filed by UE in this case, it invokes specific prohibited practices that specifically raise the question that's here in the case. I mean, literally, they allege under Chapter 2010 a failure to bargain in good faith. They allege under 2010-2A of refusal to negotiate in good faith. And then they seek exactly the same remedy that they sought in the district court. And here, in their own pleading, you, you we're talking about the facts of the case, they say that on February 13th, the state of Iowa informed UE Local 893 that it would not ratify its own initial proposal as accepted. And so, essentially, the undisputed facts on their face is that we've got a formation question here. Oh. And I think that, I'm, I'm sorry, but I was gonna try and finish and argue and, and answer your, your question, but I think that you've got a scheme that has all these mechanisms. It says that these shall be filed, PPCs shall be filed. They're subject to 17A. And the things that in the, in the framework are expressly permitted is the enforcement thereof under 2017-5 with a really limited defense, right? And in the context of a conciliation and adjudication process that requires mandatory binding arbitration. So this is not a situation where there's ever gonna be a question about whether there is an agreement. And to enforce an agreement, it's gonna to come to you in two ways, either a path that's truly voluntary, and they're trying to convert a dispute on formation into voluntary, because they know that that's the one path. The other path is if it comes through binding arbitration and there's an arbitration order or a ruling by the PER board, which is charged by the legislature to do this, that then can proceed up the path to you on judicial review. The Maquoketa Valley decision in details talks about the fact that even if you're dealing with the validity of the contract and of the award, that that is a formation question. And then in the Ask Me case in 1992, this court parsed that. And when the, the, the state tried to raise the statutory defense under 2017-6, the union said, oh, no, no, it has to be judicial review, ironically. And the court says, no, it doesn't, because this is not a formation issue. This is a defense to the enforcement of the agency award and so the one of the issues about this and, and there's a couple of important points but i think it's not as expressed so i'll concede that but when you look at the breadth of our statutory scheme compared to the nlrb scheme it's more specific and more exhaustive in many ways the fact that even in that face that if you look at the pepsi case that 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 plaintiffs rely upon in this case ironically again the court adopted the special bargaining rules that didn't follow common law based largely on the fact that collective bargaining <laughs> was a unique framework and that the, the bargaining power was different because the, in, this, in our case, the public employer can't walk away. There's always gonna be an agreement one way or the other. So I, I, I agree it's different. I don't think it waters down the intent, and you look at the very beginning to the policy statement to take these disputes, the argument you just heard, out of the, out of the courts, put it in front of, board, uh, of, a, of a board designed to implement Chapter 20 consistently, and then give them a remedy for two things, judicial review and enforcement of the terms of a contract, that you can't just scriven a lawsuit and say, well, I want you to enforce the terms, and by the way, I'm gonna ask you to litigate, maybe at trial, based on the discussion I just heard about whether there was formation or not. It's not the scheme. What, so, what are the practical 
consequences if we allow this case to be a vehicle to move formation questions from PERB into, into district court? What, what are we losing? Well, I think you just saw it. I mean, you're, you're going you're gonna to have trials uh, over every contract about intent, authority, fact questions. I mean, Gosh, the that's what we have every day. In the, I mean, w going back to law school and elements of contract, I mean, if you're trying to enforce a contract, number one is was there a contract? Number two, was Absolutely. it breached? Was it damaged? Agreed. And so forth. And, and formation is part and parcel of a, of a claim to enforce a contract. Yes, uh -huh. it is, but, but, but the, the thing that is absolutely clear about Chapter 20 on all the sections is the legislature made a determination in 1974 to treat contracts between public employers and public employees differently. I, and, I, and, I, and that's why, I mean, I agree, I don't think the legislature wants it to be like law school or like what we just heard. I, 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 I accept the, the notion that uh, public employment or um, collective bargaining generally is kind of a unique statutory right. animal that has that I, has I do want to get back because I have still not answered your question about the rule <laughs> and I want to go back to something that 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 in the argument before it came up which is that provision of the rule 2017 uh, 4 expressly says that the proposed agreement which is you bargain to a proposed agreement, which is the one that we all agree has to be ratified by the union, must be made public before it can be a real agreement. And I think a fair way to read the rule in the context of public entities and the, the intersection with rules 21 and others is on this authority issue, which is that is a way to facilitate the time period needed for public notice. The statute makes clear that you can't just say, gotcha, there's an agreement and it's an enforceable agreement, which is exactly what the unions tried to do here. There has to be an opportunity for the public to know what it is. That would be meaningless if there's not a ratification step. The other thing I'll add about the rule discussion, Your Honor, is this, is if, if we're now reduced to an argument about whether the rule is appropriate or constitutional or should be applied in these cases, I mean, we're right back into the realm of what should be judicial review. This is a rule under Holland Rake. If the real challenge here, if the real fight is about the application of the rule, it ought to be on judicial review. This court has said that before, too. So th this all cries out, and this is why we focused on the jurisdictional question. We made an argument on subject matter jurisdiction that was, was essentially this, that on the face of the complaint, regardless of, of invoking 2017-5, this clearly was always a formation question. We made a, 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 the mirror image argument that they failed to exhaust, which led, leads to the same no subject matter jurisdiction result. It's just that we focus on the procedures, the statute, that requires PPCs to be filed. Shall is the word, it gives them adequate remedies. And so that's the other thing. We focus on failure to exhaust. Important here because in fact, UE filed a prohibited practices complaint and then immediately abandoned it in favor of an original proceeding in district court, which well, is what would authorized. Be, let me say, what uh, I understand you have a dispute on the merits. But let's say uh, your, your client had approved the contract but then refused to sign it. So we were at that stage, stage of the situation. Um, what would the pr prohibited practice be that um, PERB would, uh, that they would go to the uh, PERB to complain about? What so, would it be? So if they agreed to it, ratified it, but then refused to execute it, um, I still think it, it would look just like the Pepsi case. I mean, that's exactly the facts of the Pepsi case. Right, but, in, in, but again, under, under federal law, refusing to sign the contract is, is an unfair labor practice. I, there isn't any such thing in, in the state law. Which well, it, it's, there, it's phrased a little broader, but I mean, if you look at the, the rule, I mean, uh, 2010, 20.10, refusal to bargain in good faith, uh, 2010 to a 
refusal to negotiate in good faith. I mean, those are all obligations that require you to complete the process. And so if you have a contract, if it's been formed, frankly, probably whether it's signed or not, I mean, I think that once there's a formation issue and it's been duly authorized, let's put it that way, that, that an enforcement action like we saw in the ASME case in 1992 is all that went away. What happened is essentially the governor decided he didn't want to, he, he didn't want to perform. He didn't want to pay. And this court said that is an enforcement action under 2017-5. That's what legislature meant and that's what this is. And I think that's the answer and I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, thank you as well. Mr. Gribble. Thank you, Your Honor. We think initially the question of jurisdiction is answered by 2017-5. It says that, uh, and we think jurisdiction is exclusive in the district court uh, with respect to the enforceability of a collective bargaining agreement. Well, it says in to enforce the terms, and they draw a distinction between enforcing the terms and actually enforcing whether there's an agreement or not. There is, there is that difference in language, you would agree, right? Uh, Your Honor, there is, but here we have, uh, by stipulated facts, um, offer, acceptance, and ratification all stipulated to by the employer. At this point, it doesn't appear that there can be much argument uh, that under 2017-4 that a contract has been formed and thus the enforcement mechanism is 2017-5. Um, we have that, that they accepted uh, the offer on February 4th, it was made back in December and then, or February 10th and then ratified on the 14th. So we think there we certainly have a contract. Uh, as to the privative practices, uh, generally in my experience, um, what PERB can do generally is issue cease and desist orders um, and enter into consent orders with parties. PERB Could generally has control of the- Couldn't they order them to sign a contract? PERB as uh, it under prohibited practices? No, Your Honor, I don't believe they can. I believe all they can do is issue a cease and desist order and they wouldn't have the jurisdiction here. And some of these questions uh, Mr. Thompson raised, PERB did hear back in June. There's a motion to stay those prohibited practices and the employer, uh, the state of Iowa, made the arguments on exhaustion of administrative remedies and primary jurisdiction. All it was asked for, for was a stay, so that's all PERB could grant. Here, here's where I think Mr. Thompson has a point though, is um, on, on the one hand, uh, you're saying we should decide the case and it doesn't belong in PERB and it belongs with this group of sort of seven generalist judges who are generalists in the law. On the other hand, you're not arguing for us to apply kind of the classic law of contracts that we learned in law school. You're saying apply this specialized labor law principles of contract uh, as exemplified by the Pepsi-Cola case. Isn't there a bit of a contention in that? This, a bit of a contradiction? I don't think so, Your Honor, because basically you adopted in Sergeant Bluff uh, back in 1979 uh, those principles that collective bargaining agreements were unique and you applied the private sector principles there uh, to the enforcement of, an in, of a grievance arbitration award. Uh, you referred to John Wiley and Sons and basically the same cases that uh, were cited in Pepsi-Cola in the Eighth Circuit. So I think the court has already recognized the uniqueness of collective bargaining and, uh, and adopted those uh, private sector principles in, in looking at collective agreements itself. What so ab What about the public uh, notice problem? Um, the suggestion is made that under the statute uh, an agreement has to be made public and it, it does say that. Um, uh, doesn't that imply uh, a ratification process of some kind? I don't think so, Justice Apple. Just uh, there's public notice. There's supposed to be public notice before the initial bargaining sessions given by the public employer. Uh, the public employer doesn't do that. It's a question of what's the penalty or what's the remedy. But it would be certainly something out of control uh, of the union. That's something that the union could control. It's the public employer that well, says it's supposed to make it public. Whole, I'm sorry to talk over you, but if the whole process were done in secret, um, you would say it'd be fully enforceable? Excuse me? Would you? If, if the collective bargaining process in its entirety were done in secret, you would say that it, didn't vi that it would be enforceable, although there might be some violations? 
Uh, I'm not sure I still understood your question. If it's, if it's all in secret, would it be enforceable? Yes. Uh, I'm saying yes, that I think that it would. Uh, the, the, the question could be raised that it wasn't held Public notice wasn't given of the first two initial sessions. Those are the only ones that have to be in public. The rest of the process is in private anyway, unless the parties agree otherwise, until you get to the very end of the process. So I don't think that would be enough uh, to vacate the, the contract uh, itself. Given the unique features of a collective bargaining law, um, isn't PER better suited than, than a district court judge or, or our court to decide formation issues? I think theoretically we could argue that, but that's not what our statute provides. It clearly provides that the control of the process is PERB, but once you get to the result, that's for the court by 2017-5. Uh, PERB has said that. They said that back in 92 in the ASME case because the state first went to PERB in 92, asking for PERB to find there was no contract. Uh, PERB refused, saying under 2017-5, the question is here for the court. Petition's been filed in court. That's how it should be decided. So I think theoretically you could argue that, who's it, better, but that's not what our law provides. If you assume um, the contract's been formed, what mechanisms does PERB have to enforce it? Uh, PERB really doesn't have any mechanisms to enforce it because their remedial power is so weak. Uh, just the consent order uh, and the cease and desist order. That's all really they have. They don't really have an enforcement mechanism. So you have a f futility argument to a requirement to spend more time in PERB that you don't need to go back there uh, if you have a contract. It's really the district court that has to enforce it. Yes, Your Honor. I think we have a futility argument, and I think we have a, a jurisdiction argument that given 2017-5, that's where the jurisdiction is, is here with the court. And that's how it was considered in, uh, in 92. Uh, that's the mechanism chosen was 2017-5. I realized there was an arbitration award there, but it was only on one issue on wages. All the other issues in 92 are resolved by the parties at the bargaining table. And you found that the appropriate means by which to seek to enforce uh, the collective agreement. The state there was claiming that either there was not a contract or in the alternative there was a contract, but they were not required to perform. And the court considered and resolved those issues. We think you should do the same here and find, based on offer, acceptance, ratification, uh, completion of the process under 2017-4, that there is a contract. Thank you. Mr. Gerbel, thank you as well. Mr. Thompson, you may present your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. There's, uh, there seems to be a concern about enforcement, so I just I want to go back to that for a second, because I think that what's really clear, we, we talk about 2017, it's, again, it's not just a statute that says offer acceptance ratification. There's, there's numerous provisions, one of which is um, 10, which, which really is a specific provision that makes clear that, that the parties aren't going to walk away. There's going to be an agreement, and it's PERB's job to ensure that. And it says that the board shall by rule on a date which, uh, by rule a date on which any impasse item must be submitted to binding arbitration and for such other procedure as deemed necessary to provide for the completion of negotiations by a date certain, which was March 15th under the statute. If we go back to the ASME case, the 1993 ASME case, it, you've decided this question. And what the court starts with is an acknowledgement that everybody agrees that an arbitrator's decision on impasse items are deemed to be the collective bargaining agreement, therefore are subject to enforcement under 2017-5. I mean, that's the mechanism where you can sue if you have to. That's, that's, I, don't, I don't disagree with that, it's that but it's, it's for a limited purpose, to enforce an existing agreement, the difference between enforcement and formation. The court also said that, that Iowa Code says a panel's decision is final and binding. This issue about, you know, is there a way out? No, it's not. And that's why the district court original jurisdiction is limited to enforcement. The district court in this case did not have subject matter jurisdiction to resolve a formation question by virtue of the framework under Chapter 20. Uh, it is 
clear, I think, from the comprehensive statute. Are you talking authority or jurisdiction? I mean, because excuse authority me, authority or jurisdiction? Because we always have authority to, I mean, we always have jurisdiction to decide contracts. And it sounds like maybe in this case the legislature, in your argument, took away that authority uh, under the statute. And there's a difference because in the other case, you can waive authority, but you can't waive jurisdiction. I think it's jurisdictional. And, and I'll, I'll concede that, that there's, there's some confusion, I think, in some of the cases that deal in particular with exhaustion of administrative remedies. But I think the court has ended up at the place where if, if re exhaustion is required, then if raised, then that divers the district court of jurisdiction. And I think it's subject matter jurisdiction. I think in this case, not only did they file a PPC and were required to exhaust it on the issues they raised in the PPC, which are identical to the issues that they've raised in the lawsuit, uh, they were required to exhaust. They didn't. They, they should. It's, it should have been dismissed. We attacked this on a motion to dismiss. It's also apparent from the face of the petition that even though it claims to be an enforcement action, all the facts recited, the attachments that show two different proposals, scream out formation. Your so, argument would be: I mean, they're not suing the agency, so it's not a judicial. It's not a 17A. Proceeding. Uh, it isn't on its face. It, and and you you would say 2017-5, which says terms of a collective bargaining agreement may be enforced by civil action. That doesn't apply, and by implication, excludes other kinds of actions in the district court in the context. With of regard to collective bargaining covered by chapter. And 20. since 301 of the LMRA is jurisdictional, this is jurisdictional. That well, would well be I think it's argument. jurisdictional not because of the way the federal law looks, but because Iowa law specifies under our Administrative Procedures Act and the invocation of 17A, which is in this statute, that there's a jurisdictional path to challenge agency action. And I think this is squarely that comprehensive scheme that requires exhaustion and provides an adequate remedy. But they, in, any, in any contract action, the issues are, number one, does a contract exist and what are the terms? So always when you're trying to enforce a contract, you have those issues. I mean, isn't it part of the enforcement of a contract, those issues? This isn't any contract action, Your Honor, with all due respect. This is a Chapter 20 collective bargaining agreement between the state of Iowa and Union it says to enforce that contract, and in order to enforce that contract, you have to determine what the terms are and, and whether one exists. I, again, there's the statute says enforcement, but you can't read 2017-5 as if it was hanging out in the ether. I mean, it is in the context of a comprehensive statute that talks about impasse, that talks about negotiability, Justice Waterman. You just wrote a long decision about negotiability. So there's a, there's, there's a statutory framework that governs what you negotiate, how you negotiate it, and ultimately determines what the agreement is. You all, with all due respect, don't get to do that. Ultimately, you can enforce it. That's what the district court could have done. That's not what this case was about. If you don't have any further questions, I think you should reverse the district court. Uh, the court should have dismissed this petition for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, thank you as well. Mr. Gribble, thank you again. The case of uh, UE Local 893 is now then submitted and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.